So I'm here to talk about some of the gambling ships running off the coast of Southern California from the late 20s until the late 30s. And they were off the coast of our general area, anywhere between Seal Beach to Santa Monica. They all operated out at International Waters, which is from what I read in 1928 is began- an amusement park? What, International Waters? Yeah. yeah. It's like Raging Waters, <laughs> but there literally is no enforcement of any of the rules. It's like Hurricane Harbor, but you can make a lot of money if you know the right people. So in 1928, International Waters began basically three miles off the coastline, which later gets debated. I was trying to understand like current international waters laws and I think it now extends to like over 200 miles or at least that's what's considered high seas and actually might be 24 miles from the baseline. It might be like where international waters starts, but it's not certainly not three miles off the coast like it was in 1928. So it's it's changed since then. Like If I read correctly, be? yeah, it's changed. Okay. They're like different markers for like, oh, this the is, state still allows to get you yeah, if you're this, this close. 12 we're miles we're in coast. federal waters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here we go again. The 1920s montage. Hugh the Charleston as old Lindbergh flew nonstop from New York to Paris defending Adolf Hitler the entire way. The Tommy gun sails were through the roof and into a hot air balloon over the First National Bank as Pretty Boy Floyd floated away with what is today $75 million. Flappers worldwide got their stomach pump on a regular basis. In Los Angeles, our city, as we bring up all the freaking time now, 1920s Los Angeles, population doubles as we became a major metropolitan city with a booming movie industry and Orange Grove labels in the air and whatever else we mentioned in every episode. Organized crime, like Daniel was saying, and corruption was the bee's knees. And one of the many insidious limbs of organized crime was, like we mentioned, gambling. Gambling and one of the other arms was booze running, as we mentioned in our Prohibition episode, Candy is Dandy, but Liquor is click here. I, I think about that all the time. <laughs> I, I think, wow, I really nailed it that time. Uh, I was talking to my cousin about our episode titles. Her husband was struggling to say my favorite title. And I like, I said it with so much enthusiasm, a tale of two CDs. <laughs> yeah. The, but the best it'll ever be. Yeah. But it's no, well, look, I was thinking we should start posting like all of the reject titles I submit to you, <laughs> if you because remember. I think Mary had a little fan would have been a great <laughs> episode title. It doesn't make any sense. So what? <laughs> Does anything we say make sense? So, Tony Cornero was born Anthony Stralla in the Piedmont region of Italy, which is near the French border. Oh, so this is a real Italian. This is a real Italian This is man. a paisan, Greg. This is a real pasta ghoul you got talking. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's a real fiend for marinara, isn't he? <laughs> he was born in August of 1889, and the Stralla family came to the U.S. in 1904, settling in the Los Gatos area of Santa Clara County. He joined the Navy, but at the dawn of the 20s when Prohibition was implemented, he switched sides and used his naval knowledge to funnel booze into the United States from Canada. Okay, that's very interesting. Yeah. So he used his knowledge of international waters to to yeah. manipulate the country that welcomed him in. <laughs> <laughs> and this goes further to my point. <laughs> Just another piece of evidence. <laughs> From one article I read, he was a full-fledged rum pirate, like hijacking boats and soon building a fleet of ships to run rum and other liquors to the, the shores of LA. Uh, and there's even a map at some point of all the places in like Santa Barbara and Malibu and like Redondo Beach and Seal Beach and just San like Diego. Shipping in rum. He would just like bring wow. alcohol in. By 1923, he was the king hey, of oh, boot oh. Li- by 1923, he was the Back king. Back to Will Smith. Why do you wait for me to talk? <laughs> <laughs> My mind, uh, sometimes it's a little not so sharp. And it takes me, it takes me having to hear you speak <laughs> before I think. What's, uh, that's an annoying sound. I should say something over that. Sometimes you stir the cauldron and sometimes you taste. Is it <laughs> sometimes ready? Sometimes you let it simmer. <laughs> By 1923, he was the king of bootleggers, smuggling in thousands of cases of illegal alcohol into California. It's going great, right? And it's going to go great forever. In May of 1924, old Tony gets an order of liquor to be delivered at 150 South Hobart Avenue in Koreatown. Wouldn't you believe it? It was a sting. Could you believe it? In this day and age, 1924, (laughs) at the height of Prohibition. When the movie The Sting took place. (laughs) Tony Carnero opened fire and the cops fired back. He wounded a cop. Wait, wait, wait. So this was in Koreatown? Koreatown. How did his boat get there? Uh, that's only a partly joking question. It wasn't <laughs> always boats. Like sometimes he would, like he was probably living in Los Angeles at the time. So it wasn't like it uh, wasn't escape like, from LA where there's a... <laughs> exactly. He didn't surf into <laughs> Koreatown. No, he probably like was running liquor up to the shore okay. and then was like, okay, well now I gotta back get to, to the it. boat. Yeah, back to the boat, back to the boat. <laughs> they can't touch us in international waters three feet off the shore. <laughs> Anyways, he shows up. He's got like a giant 10 gallon hat on, <laughs> which he filled with alcohol. It kept him afloat the whole time. So he shoots, cops shoot 
shoot back. He shoots a cop and wounds him. He himself gets shot in the arm and the leg and is arrested. But because it's the 20s, assault with a deadly weapon charge was dropped down from $25,000 to $5,000. And he was soon back on the street. <laughs> the cop was sort of like, is a, it was just a misunderstanding because he was probably paid by somebody. <laughs> uh, he was arrested again in 1925 after the feds scooped up a large liquor load from him, but couldn't keep him for long. Well, the, the guy I was talking about, Farmer Page, because Tony Cornero kept kind of yeah, coming yeah, yeah. up in that. And I didn't, I was like, Greg will. Hands off. Greg will get get Tony Cornero's name out of your mouth, Greg will say to me. <laughs> I, I think they were enemies. Like, I think they yeah. even had a few, not, not personally, but they, like their people had a few shootouts between Farmer Page. There was and, an all out liquor war, basically, yeah. <laughs> between Farmer Page. Your favorite kind of war. <laughs> I benefit. No matter who wins, I win. <laughs> Prices are dropping, you say. <laughs> yeah, they was, it was an all out war between, yeah, Farmer Page, Tony Cornero, and I think there was another guy whose name I don't remember, but people were getting killed. There was eventually a, a gunning down of a liquor hijacker, Walter Heskeith, alias Eddie Egan, which Tony may or may not have done. Uh, it was four more years of being rousted by, you know, cops just trying to make a name for himself and going to war with different outfits and, you know, laying low before the October of 1929 when Tony Cornero turned himself into S.H. Hammer of the Special Intelligence Unit of the IRS. Did like Why? The, I think that, oh, because back taxes and everything, which is how they, they got he turned all, himself. So oh, I think he, we'll he get got to it. Truman, not Truman Capote, he's Al Capone. He got Al <laughs> Caponed, yeah. He wrote in cold blood. He's a little kid from uh, <laughs> To Kill a Mockingbird. Oh, golly. Yeah. <laughs> no, he was more like more like he he had like a, a seersucker suit and like yeah. a, well, I never. Well, he was a little bit Aunt B. <laughs> Somewhere between Gomer Pyle and Aunt B. <laughs> he turned himself in because he was he said like I wanted to start a fresh life without having to lay low from the feds like he had been okay. for five years. And But like, his fresh life was going to still be illegal. <laughs> we'll get to that. Or was that not the idea? I mean, like a time? lot of, I think a lot of gangsters of this era even going all the way to like Mickey Coe and we're like I'm starting fresh and you know I might do a couple years in the clink but you know what I'm out and I'm going to start a you know flower <laughs> shop and then the feds are like how are you going to start money a for flower the shop wink wink <laughs> <laughs> so he was sentenced to two years at McNeil Island supposedly uh, during all of this he bought a steamership in Hamburg Germany and carried off a cargo of a million bottles of booze which was seized in New that Orleans that song is going to go on forever <laughs> <laughs> but I read that I was all, while I was reading that part I'm like what <laughs> anyways McNeil Island Tony Tony Canero's stint in the clink would be brief. But in the meantime, something else was happening just off the shore of LA. The first of these gambling ships appears in 1928 and was named the Joanna Smith, which is a steam schooner built during the First World War and was a lumber ship until it was sold to Albert Howard, who converted it to a palatial gambling ship. It's not really clear at what point it hits them that like, we're on the coast. If you go three miles that way, they can't do anything. <laughs> and like, I guess we could, can we put my house on the wa water? And then I'm sure it took them a while before we're like, I'll just buy a ship. How big were, like, from what you're describing it sounds like one of those giant things that are like pulling into the port of San Pedro but I in my head I always imagined it just like a big yacht it seems like a smaller yacht uh, like I've seen pictures mm -hmm. I'm like oh, I can't tell really because like the it's like the horizon it's is what you have to like measure it again yeah, like scale again so I'm like I don't it know looks how really small is it are we talking like Putin's yacht or are we talking like I keep forgetting the guy from uh, Sex Island whatever uh, Sex God, we Island. bring him up in like every episode what is that guy the guy who died who who died. died. <laughs> <laughs> no, he really died. It's sure. quotations if he killed himself. He died. What was his name? Um, oh my God. What does it uh, matter? Giselle. Uh, Jeffrey Epstein. Jeffrey Epstein. Jesus. So are we talking Putin yacht or I Jeffrey Epstein? I got a nosebleed coming up with that name. Uh, I'm going to say uh, maybe a Putin Putin level. Oh, that's ship. pretty big. I maybe I don't know how big Putin is. I thought that Jeffrey Epstein was richer you than Putin. You thought Jeffrey <laughs> He has an island, doesn't Greg. he? nobody's richer than Putin. <laughs> Does the leader of Russia have a big yacht? He Does he have an <laughs> island? Is the Pope Catholic? <laughs> Who has a bigger yacht, the Pope or Putin? <laughs> Joanna Smith operated 14 miles out to sea from Long Beach and seven miles from Seal Beach. Joanna Smith was a luxurious, like I said, steam schooner and reportedly had gambling halls, a dance floor, and a dining saloon. The gambling equipment was thanks to a man named Ed Turner who purchased it in Tijuana and included one roulette table, three craps tables, three blackjack tables, and two chuck-a-luck tables? <laughs> which I cannot figure out what that is. That's where the clowns would perform. <laughs> and 23 slot machines that varied between a nickel and a dollar. On the Joanna Smith, silver dollars were used as chips Ooh. and chips were called fries. Really? No, stupid. <laughs> oh, I get it. You're being continental. <laughs> I screamed that joke to Ada while she was busy and she was like, 
Huh, that is something you would say. Well, because right. you distracted me because we're talking about the ocean. You said dollars, and I was thinking sand dollars, and I was like, uh, I'm like oh, sand I got dollars. a sand dollar joke. Oh, you know what? What, what's that? what about fries? I forgot <laughs> that it's a joke about food, so I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have thrown it. <laughs> we that don't eight. joke about that. <laughs> Not on this show. <laughs> Anyways, it seems like the Joanna Smith only operated a week in 1928. I don't know if, I, like, I, from what I can tell, before they were like the authorities boarded it. it very interesting reading about how they would do this because it was legal. Authorities boarded it, which is legal on international waters where there is no such thing as legal or illegal like of course we yeah, can get on your yeah. boat and raid it and oh, throw all the yeah. stuff in the ocean it's, oh, a, it's yeah it's legal to do we're not this cops anymore yeah. we're just we're just like you we're just like you and if you're gonna shoot me in cold blood who knows how that's gonna <laughs> not turn if i out. get you first a huge problem was the very legal taxi boats that would take people out to the joanna smith there's no legal means at the time to prevent the taxi boats who had permits from doing that and albert howard who ran the ship also had the legal means to stop any law enforcement officers from stopping him apparently outside three miles it was safe for gambling ships but not for rum runners who had a 12 mile area to avoid it was, if i read correctly like if you wanted to run a gambling ship you could do that so within, it was more illegal to, to run be, liquor to have alcohol because gambling. that's a federal crime as opposed to a state crime we you need to draw like like they, those topography things with the squiggly with lines the squiggly lines, like yeah. how, Just how tell far me where how, I could, i'm gonna give you a list of crimes i want to commit <laughs> and you tell me how far out i have to go for each one it's like the middle of the arctic if you want to do that you got to go here okay okay <laughs> all right I all right uh, I, what is the, the boat from the thing of him. <laughs> so nothing was done to Joanna Smith. They they got boarded. They I think they tried to arrest him, but like they made a like. Uh, Who's Joanna Smith, by the way? Oh, I have no idea who they named it after. It's a ship, but I don't know who they named it after. I bet like. Oh, that makes sense. Now. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh ship. <laughs> also appearing in 1928 was a Monte Carlo Monfalcone, which was a five masted barge or a wind jammer purchased by gangster Jack Dragna, a J.W. Burns, and some other wise guy types, and converted into a pleasure barge. So Jabba, this was Jabba's. It's place. Jabba's place. Yeah. He doesn't take it out every time, but when he wants to kill a couple of people he's gonna everyone on the pleasure bar was like the international sea dunes international desert of tatooine it's it's the water world version the uh, dry water world of the return of the jedi yeah, yeah. oh yeah uh, we're in reality you're right this is this the water is that's right that's right there's no star like pit there is a cthulhu monster <laughs> and this is reality right? <laughs> we are being real right now this was found in a non-fiction book so they ran it off the coast uh six months off the coast of san pedro i found this one page called the california wreck divers page. I don't know where they found this quote, but the mouth Alcone was described as gaudily painted to sides and had interior transformed into a cafe and casino that equals the best Mexican resorts. Uh, there was a huge covered dancing pavilion and was added above their main deck and gambling tables were all set up all at the cost of $58,000. Uh, pretty nice. It's pr- it does sound pretty <laughs> nice. And the name is great though. Monte Carlo Mouth Alcone. So it's such <laughs> it's a, a lot. There's like uh, two different references I feel like <laughs> going on in there. It was towed numerous times by the Coast Guard into San Pedro as laws were inching closer to banning gambling ships and were in the meantime finding any ways to obstruct their operations. So the Coast Guard deemed the Malfalcone as a hazard to navigation and used that as a basis to continually tow it in and break up any kind of illegal things they were doing on there. Although it was legal where they were. I'm on the sides of the ships, really. They weren't hurting anybody except for all the people they hurt, except for all the lives they destroyed. Yeah, except for all that money they were uh, forcibly taking from people who weren't losing. In 1929, the feds made it, they finally made it illegal for taxi boats to to take passengers out to gambling ships. Okay. To get around this, the Malfalcone was aided never by- Never illegal to swim. If you can make it three miles out here, you're welcome to gamble and we'll give you one free gambling chip. <laughs> one free show from Paul Anka. <laughs> to get around that, the Malfalcone was aided by another ship, the Centennial, which was not a taxi boat and for a price would take passengers out to the Malfalcone. Another ship would take you out. We're not a taxi boat. We're a regular ship. So it's kind of like the draw poker thing of like, this isn't yeah. gambling. This, this is, is a gentleman's uh, yeah. cruise. <laughs> oh yeah. We're, we're, we like to take people out just a couple miles offshore and no, I don't know these people, but they pay me a fee. And they take them to another boat. Yeah. Um, uh, they gamble. <laughs> <laughs> also making it hard for the Malfalcone was the other gambling ships in the area that didn't like their business messed with. In 1930, the crew from the Joanna Smith hijacked the Malfalcone. Now, Johnny Law and Johnny Crime wouldn't have to worry about the Malfalcone too much longer as in August of 1930, a broken gas line caught fire and ignited the ship with 300 passengers aboard. Oh God. They were all taken off safely, but Malfalcone burned all night. <laughs> The Joanna Smith burned. Yeah, it did. Yeah, you goddamn right, it did. Uh, the Joanna Smith burns down in 1932. 
fire purifies all. <laughs> also, so the wreck is probably, I mean, that's probably. why it's on the, the webpage for wrecked ships off of California oh, okay. because that's how I found information. Was I thought that there. was like some sort of recording studio or something. So there, there is ships at the bottom of huh. the California. When the sea levels rise, I'm sure this debris will come washing <laughs> straight into my house so I can check. Or out. when they drop, we'll also be able to we walk go, to I it. will walk to the wreck. Either the- way. <laughs> yeah. Either way, there's a roulette table with my name on it. <laughs> uh, there's also a mention of a, a gambling ship named the City of Panama, later the City of Hollywood, which was the scene. I, I didn't find much about it other than this. The scene of an impromptu show, in quotes, by a frisky patron that, while amusing, drew customers from the gambling tables and attracted the attention of bouncers. The patron was found beaten to death. Oh. I have no this further information. Worth, okay, I was th- I was expecting this to be one of those stories of like that patron, Charles <laughs> Chaplin. <laughs> I was not expecting the little tramp to be beaten An to death. An appropriately aged Charles <laughs> Chaplin. I wanted to know what the impromptu show was. I wanted to know, while well, amusing, he's dead and I couldn't find his name so I couldn't look him up. What was his act? <laughs> I want to know what was his act. Something else happened in 1930 though. Tony Cornero was released from prison, a Uh free and reformed man who wanted nothing to do with crime or vice or gambling, see, or girls or money. (laughs) He emerged or boats (laughs) or the uh, open ocean. (laughs) Fishing whenever you want. (laughs) Calamari, just an arm's reach away. (laughs) Under the sea. (laughs) That's when we start singing. (laughs) On the surface of the sea. (laughs) 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 You'll be playing roulette. I like that. You'll lose your money. I'm gonna let you just work it out. Hang on. Let me call the what are those two guys that wrote all those the oh. brothers that wrote all those songs? Simon and Schulzer, I have an idea. <laughs> Barnes and Noble. <Nova. laughs> Ruby and Tuesday. Is that a, no, no, there's no end in there. He emerged and could already tell that Prohibition was on its last limb. And instead of trying to continue bootlegging, he thought maybe a gambling ship was his ticket, which was partially legal on the open seas, could prove to be profitable. Out of jail, he invested some of his bootlegging riches towards a new prospect out in the Nevada desert in the city of Las Vegas, where plenty of LA mob figures such as Billy Wilkerson had a hand in developing a new playground for gambling that was mm-hmm. Las Vegas. Cornero even opened up a casino in the third. 30s, Las Vegas's The Meadows, but it didn't last long. He returned to Los Angeles, back to the harbor of Long Beach, and started considering gambling ships a year before his competition mysteriously caught fire. Mm. The Joanna Smith and the Ma Falcone. Canero began operating his own fleet of these ships, including the Tango, but his crown jewel well, was... It takes a- two to have... He had, it had a sister ship. <laughs> the other one was Cash. Um, oh, those are the people who wrote Under the Sea. The Tango, Tango and Cash. And Cash. Yeah. Oh, no, Starsky and Hutt. <laughs> but his crown jewel was a vessel he bought in the 1930-ish year year and refurbished for $250,000 named the Rex. The Rex was the Bellagio. Like R-E-X? R-E-X. Okay. The Bellagio of the sea. Mm. And for the rest of the of history, when talking about gambling ships off the coast of Los Angeles, the Rex is always the one that first comes up. Sometimes the only one. Well, it's the king. And it's run by the king of bootlegging. So, of course, it's going to be popular. <laughs> and he has nice hats. And be nice to him, he's kind of handsome. <laughs> the hat and the Rex. Ooh. Ooh, yeah. That's a Raymond Chandler novel. <laughs> I forget, was it Hollis Black asked us who we thought the most handsome man in right. LA history was. And like, now every once in a while we'll do a name episode. I'm like, I got one more. <laughs> who did I say? I know I, I you said um, Tiburcio Vasquez, who I, I think is very unattractive. Yeah. Who and did I say? Charles, uh, who did you say? Colin Farrell? It's always Colin Farrell. <laughs> if you remember, dear listener, who <laughs> what man from history I'm attracted to, please uh, write us um, and send pictures. As many as you can find on the internet. The wrecks operate off the shore from Redondo Beach to Santa Monica. And by this time, it was deemed unconstitutional prohibit passage from water taxis to gambling ships. So customers would wait at the Santa Monica Pier at a big X to be picked up and sent out to the wrecks. They what were, a, like, it sounds squid gamey. Like, yeah, like yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. idea of being taken out of a place where things are legal and there are laws. To go to a place where things, and just like the, like being picked up in a van to be taken to some place yeah. where bad things or illegal things are going to happen is so scary. But now that it's on the water and I'm yeah. presuming happening at night, that's so scary to yeah, me. Yeah, it's very scary. I, the more I think about it, the, I'm like, just think about like floating. I, I've, yeah. I haven't been on a boat before, but like uh, everyone has guns. <laughs> What do you mean? You've never been on a boat? Never that far out. Never, never to international never waters. Never to international waters. I've like, <laughs> sl- like I've been like arms reach away from the coast. A swimming distance away from the coast. <laughs> the boat I was pedaling was <laughs> shaped like a duck and I was in Echo Park Lake. Yes, but. So I've been on, the, I know a little bit about pirate, <laughs> ah, the pirate seas. radio. And, yeah. <laughs> there were expert chefs on board serving fine food to what would grow to be a thousand customers daily, eventually growing to near its last days, 3,000 people a day. I, I dare say this is bigger than Putin's yacht. It sounds like a, 
that Again. like what the planes take off from in the military. It's not that big. It sounds big. I see pictures. I'm like, is that big? I can't tell. And then like, there's a, a another there's boat. Three thousand people on a boat. Well, like rotating, rotating. Oh, okay. Because it was open 24 hours. So it rotated too. It's like a lazy Susan. Oh, so it was. It wasn't just at night. No, no, people it was were going there at all like day. 10 yeah, in the <laughs> ten in the morning. Yeah, the the poor souls going at ten in the morning. The wealthy elite and the Hollywood crowd. Oh, so there were celebrities going. Yeah, there. I couldn't get any names though. It was really weird. Of course. Uh, so we'll just make it up. Mary Pickford. <laughs> um, the wealthy elite and the Charlie Hollywood Chaplin did a routine. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> like I said, rich people attended the Rex for a good time. Some gamers would bet as much as four hundred thousand dollars a day on his ship. Cronero also welcomed quote unquote squirrels aboard. You know what squirrels are? Uh, I'm reading the Witcher book, so it means something <laughs> else, but uh, no. In, it's so funny in that I'm reality. Been, no. Oh, uh, middle class common folk. Uh, uh, this uh, was his true bread and butter. What was middle class people? Squirrels. He offered rich and middle rich people a chance to win at roulette, pharaoh, blackjack, stud poker, high spade, craps, chuckaluck, and Chinese lottery. Uh, before it's Chinese we, lottery. <laughs> they're not gonna probably write regular lottery. He installed 150 machines, a horse parlor, and a bingo layout seating for 400. Before I continue. Continue. It's so funny that you read books about people who hunt witches and I read books that are super pro witch. He's not hunting witches. He's hunting monsters. All right, fine. Witches are his friend, Greg. You don't know anything about the I witcher, don't know do anything. You? Why is it called the witcher then? Okay, whatever. I, that, that I cannot answer. <laughs> uh, but wait, wait. They it's, had a horse racing track in the thing? No, they had a part of where you oh, probably bet. Okay. Like, like, they off probably, like, really off track. Really betting. off track. Yeah, you can, you, they call it in his bookies. I don't know. Off coast betting. <laughs> <laughs> Seahorses. Um, the seahorse joke in there. <laughs> He was adamant that he was running a legitimate business. His games were not illegal nor rigged and offered anyone on the spot immediate payout of $100,000 cash if they could find a game that was rigged. I'm sure you collected it with like bro the broken bones in your hand yeah. or whatever, but it, or they sent it to your widow, but yeah. <laughs> a, a nice thing to offer up. The Rex was a really a proto Vegas. Like it was a clean, delightful experience if you behaved and they offered you free or subsidized food and free transport to and from the ship. So it was a really legitimate business he was trying to run. I imagine there was a lot of vomiting people on probably this. probably yeah but like how cute like everyone's doing it oh it's not gross if we all do it on each other like, like uh clark gable just throwing up like the worst meal on the menu of brown <laughs> derby and people like you're so hot uh, this was not something he kept from people he took out full page ads in the newspapers to the rex huh. got skywriting done to promote it spelling out rex above the city but maybe rex marks the spot <laughs> that would have been a good market yeah that yeah. would have been good marketing but maybe they should have been more subtle because when even the little rinky dinking gambling ships get attacked by reformers and politicians trying to get a photo up when you're the most luxurious of all, them all you're gonna get icebergged <laughs> and the rex got icebergged the first standoff on the rex was in 1939 led by la da burin fitz well i forgot how we brought him up recently along with la county sheriff uh, sheriff bisclis we, we brought up in the earthquake episode and the santa monica police Chief Dice. Canero went back to shore. Dice Man. The Dice Man, yeah. Appropriately named the Dice Man. Canero went back to shore with them Dickery, under. Dickery, Dickery, Doc. Get off my dock. <laughs> I thought he was going to rhyme dock with something else. And very nice that he kept it G-rated. So they go to arrest him. Cornero went back to the shore with them under arrest with the intention of arguing his case out. Johnny Law stated that because Santa Monica Bay was inland, an inland body of water, that the coastline was not the true coastline, thus moving the international waters closer to shore where the Rex found itself. Because we come more inland than the regular coast, and you think right. operating three miles off of this, what's the tr we're yeah. arguing what the true coastline was, okay. so, so you're like, not operating in international waters like you think you like are. Like Pacific Pal or not Pacific Palisades, um, Palos Verde. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Palos Verde goes this far out. Yeah, so that's but then the if you're going coast. to like, what, you're, we're going to go to like Santa Barbara? Yeah, yeah. They, 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 I, I, this sounds like a really I, annoying. What, does Avalon? Does uh, Catalina count as part of our coast? Are they legal? Or yeah, what, <laughs> they got a casino there. Are you knocking on their door? <laughs> and they do gamble there, <laughs> as everybody who goes there is not confused by. Johnny Crime argued that Santa Monica Bay was not a bay; it was a bite, b i g h t, which is a mm, large like coastal bite, like canto. Thank you. It's a large coastal indention. The court sided with D.A. Fitz, Johnny Law, but it was still overturned upon appeal and Cornero returned to the operations on the Rex. So like, yeah, you proved that I was running slightly on a gray area of international waters, but nobody did anything. <laughs> then Cornero had to face off with a bigger foe in history, state attorney and L.A. born Earl Warren of the Warren Report, if you know oh, the Kennedy right, history, right. and was also the chief justice during the civil rights years, voting to desegregate schools and rejecting separate but equal laws. And was a fighter for rights of the individual and such. That's that Earl Warren. He hated gambling ships. He said that they drew millions of dollars away from legitimate civic purposes and were basically floating brothels and drug dens. Prove it. 
And then he tries to come on board. Okay, <laughs> you come too far. You can't, don't go any further. He figured that states had the power to abate a nuisance even if it lies outside the state jurisdiction. Like if there's a problem, like a nuisance around our city, even it's, if it's illegal. So they're basically like, if something bad is happening in Orange County, I'm still going to go and deal it, with it. Because it, it is affecting people in our city. Okay. That's that that's seems, the, the main. That seems like a slippery slope. That's a gray area. Yeah, that's that's not great. I like how we're on the side of the gamble. Of the, Most of the, the time. Blood thirsty camp. that's why i had to go out and say that earl warren is clearly not the bad guy in this situation remind myself like all right, all right, all right all gambling ships were thus raided and disassembled based on the state ordered cease and desist from from this uh there were four left and warren had his eye on the wrecks this led to august 1st 1939 the Battle of Santa Monica, which we brought up previously. I don't really know what happened, but I, I'm excited to hear it. Earl Warren sent out 250 local and state law enforcement officers out to sea to raid the ships off of Santa Monica and Long Beach. There was Tango and Showboat, which were anchored. <laughs> they were all horse names, by the way. Tango and Showboat were anchored off of Long Beach, and the Texas and the Rex were parked out past the Santa Monica. The Rexes were uh, parked just outside of Santa Monica. The cops rented water taxis. Uh, our old friend. That's illegal. Yeah, this, <laughs> and boarded and raised Lee and easily got on board of three of those. Uh, they tossed the gambling tables off the ship and into the ocean. Uh, there is so much gambling out there, there. under the sea. <laughs> <laughs> it's just waiting for us. Get your scuba gear. We're going to go down there. We're going to drown trying to get an old <laughs> bingo board. Um, I always knew our last words would be bingo. <laughs> <laughs> so the wrecks wouldn't be as easily boarded. First off, the officers were met with armed gunmen on the deck of the wrecks. They didn't shoot, but they were thre a threatening presence mm -hmm. for sure. But what they did shoot were high pressure fire hoses that would keep the officers on the little boats <laughs> at bay. If they did get close enough to try to board, they had a heavy steel gate to block the landing platform. So nothing could, okay. you couldn't even like get yeah. to the point where you try to land. The crew of the wrecks- Fortress. A, a, a living fortress. fortress and it's just protecting like Blackjack. The crew of the wrecks- need to play Chuckalock. <laughs> At all costs. At all costs, we have now, to protect Don't let them take Chuckalock. The crew of the Rex fought off Johnny Law for eight days this way. Whoa. An eight-day standoff. And finally caved in when Anthony Cornero decided he needed to get a haircut. <laughs> Pretty cool guy. Oh god! Law enforcement raided the ship. Look at a little shaggy around the yeah. hat. <laughs> they raided the ship and tossed all the high-end decadence into the Pacific, where Davy Jones could be heard losing to Pie Gal for all of history. <laughs> and while the gambling was legal in international waters, as in there were no laws, there are no laws saying you can't go aboard someone's ship and toss out what they have on theirs, mm. making the cops in this situation marauding pirates. <laughs> the courts took Earl Warden's side, and Carnero never faced any charges. That's how that played out. The Rex was then put to use during World War the one where the bad guys had great uniforms and eventually was sunk by a German submarine off the coast of Africa. That's what really? happened to the Rex. Yeah. Huh. Another one at the bottom of the sea. Tony under Canero the sea. under the sea. <laughs> uh, Tony Canero tried to make another, more gambling ships happen in the post-war forties, but it never really amounted to anything. I, I'm just imagining there's like an old business car or like an old matchbook from the Brown Derby now sunk off the coast of Africa. Yeah. There's like cufflings from like a Jimmy Stewart, which is not his era. He, like I was saying, he's trying to make gambling ships happen in the post-war forties but it never really matched anything. He lived in Beverly Hills after all this, 312 Elm Drive. He was married to an actress named Barbara Land, who is not too well known, but there that's the, also the name of one of the characters from Mars Attacks, which I'm currently <laughs> obsessed with. So when I typed Barbara Land in and the picture of Mars Attack came up, like, am I... <laughs> <laughs> Am I doing this wrong? What happened? In February of 1955, Derek, some sort of crime meeting was happening at his place. A messenger came over and pulled a gun and shot Canero. He survived, but that August of 1955, he died at a dice table in Las Vegas, dropped dead from a coronary thrombosis at the Desert Inn. He was in Nevada waiting- Coronary thrombosis. thrombosis. Wow. We should have seen this coming. He was in Nevada at the time awaiting the opening of his new resort, The Stardust. And that is- Everything I have about Anthony Cornero and the gambling ships off the coast memorialized in Farewell, My Lovely, which is a great novel by Raymond Chandler, maybe my favorite. 